Uh, my name is Kevin Richardson. I'm with Paul the Harm, and I'm one of your hosts tonight. And I want to welcome you all again and say thank you for joining us. And let's get started with this icebreaker. Cool. Um, so this is a really cool map of the United States. If you all start posting in the chat your location, your city and state, it'll start popping up here. So this will let it give us a good shot to let us know kind of where we're coming from. So, all right, seeing lots of folks popping up already, several people in, six people in Pennsylvania, nice. Uh, two people in Colorado, uh, one person out in San Francisco, we got three in Colorado. Keep it coming. So a lot of interest in the Northeast. That's great, a lot of people from the, the states that we're talking about tonight. Someone from Tennessee and someone from Illinois and Ohio. Uh, anyone in the Ohio River Valley, it's going to be an, probably an important issue for. Some more folks from Colorado and Pennsylvania. Cool. For those of you who just joined us a, a few minutes uh, after we started, we're doing this really cool icebreaker where if you drop your city and state in the chat, it'll show up on this map and get a good idea of, of where folks are coming from. Got some more Pennsylvania folks, got someone from Maryland. Cool, draw mine from Dallas, Los Angeles. Some more folks from New York, we got six people in New York or so. That's pretty cool. Awesome. Uh, any other takers? I want to drop your location in the chat. We can put it on the map. Awesome. Well, that was really cool to see. We got um, a good mixture of folks, a lot of folks from the these states in particular. As exciting as that feature, I think it helps us to kind of connect a little bit to see where everyone's coming from. Great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the screen share right now. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. And then I'm just going to share a quick PowerPoint slide and we're going to get the show started. Oops. Okay. Once again, welcome to Protected Zones, Oil and Gas Setbacks in California, Colorado, and Pennsylvania. Super excited for tonight's webinar. This is going to be a packed one. Uh, a couple of words of warning before we start. Uh, this webinar will be, we have booked about 75 minutes for it. Totally understand that a lot of folks will need to drop off after 60 minutes. That's totally fine. The plan is to do um, a quick introduction from Kyle Ferrer from Fact Tracker, who's the other host tonight. Then we'll switch to doing our panel moderation. We'll start with introductions from all three of the, the states, California, Colorado, and Pennsylvania. And then continue the moderated panel discussion um, with some pre-selected questions. And for the last 15 minutes, right about the 60 minute mark, we're gonna go into audience Q&A. Um, folks, feel free to drop your questions in the chat and we'll keep track of them. Once we get to Q&A, we'll be able to, to read them off. But for now, I'm gonna pass um, things over to Kyle Ferrer from Frack Tracker Alliance, who is going to introduce the rest of tonight's webinar. Go for it, Kyle. Wonderful, thank you so much, Kevin. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us tonight as we take a deep and thoughtful look at public health setbacks for oil and gas extraction and production operations. Setbacks ultimately forbid new drilling and other extraction related activities within, is, within an established distance from homes, schools, healthcare facilities, and other sensitive receptor sites that may include businesses, organic farms, prisons, and other sensitive land uses. The science is clear. Living closer to denser oil and gas extraction operations puts humans' health at risk and at, at, at elevated risk. As a policy goal, setbacks have therefore become a top priority for protecting the health of frontline communities and may also be the first step in environmentally decarcerating our communities and our planet from the death grip of the fossil fuel industry. 
I'm the Western Program Coordinator from Frack Tracker Alliance, and I am joined by organizers and community health advocates from three states that are on the forefront of the setbacks movement. Our intention is to have an open and honest conversation about fighting for setbacks in three very different political organizing landscapes. We will consider whether setbacks are a useful approach for stopping negative health impacts and environmental harms from oil and gas. What may have worked in one state may not have in the others. We are hoping that exploring our tactics and outcomes will be useful for both organizers in the audience as well as organizers on stage. So from Pennsylvania, the number one gas producing state in the country, we have Matt Kelso of the Frack Tracker Alliance and Andrew Woomer of Clean Air Council. From Colorado, where oil and gas drilling is expanding at one of the fastest rates in the country, we have Lauren Petri from Colorado Rising, Lori Anderson from the City of Broomfield City Council, and Kate Christensen from 350 Colorado. And from my home state of California, an oil, an oil giant in decline, we have Cesar Aguirre from the Central California Environmental Justice Network, Kobe Nasek from Vision, and Woody Little, campaign lead at Last Chance Alliance. Our host this evening will be Kevin Richardson from Halt the Harm Network. Many thanks to Halt the Harm Network. Without them, organizing this event could not have been possible. And without further ado, I'll pass the mic over to Kevin so we can get started. Thanks, everyone. Cool, thank you, Kyle. Um, thank you for that awesome introduction. Um, we're gonna get started with the panel discussion today. We have a fully packed schedule with lots of questions, lots to discuss, so we're gonna get right into it. Um, I will say, as a member of Paul Tarm Network, one of our major um, positions is that in order to stop the oil and gas industry, we really need a network theory of change, which means we need to be supporting local and statewide grassroots movements everywhere in the country. And I think that's what's really made this webinar planning and this webinar so special to me is that we've definitely um, brought together folks from different states to engage and talk about tactics, strategies, resources, and exchange those. Um, and I think that's like the central element of a network theory of change, which is that in order for all this to work, for all these um, all these local grassroots campaigns um, to have the impact, we got to be talking to each other, exchanging ideas, and helping each other out. And that's kind of the the kind of great great outcome we have hope to have out of this um, webinar today. And we hope you guys in the audience will um, come back with some questions and some thoughts and some strategies, some ideas, as well as contributed some to some of these great organizers who have contributed their time to the call today. Um, in terms of the setbacks themselves, this is an interesting, I think, an important policy. And as we'll see in all three states, it has a different impact depending on how it's implemented depending on where it's implemented and the political climate. And it's definitely an open question about the validity of this as a tactic, depending on where you are and how things get done. And I wanna, I hope that that comes to the forefront today, that the sort of questions about tactics, strategy, effectiveness, and the differences between the different regions. Cool. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and start our panel discussion. And we're gonna start with introductions from each of the three states. We're gonna talk a little bit about the political context and the background um, of the oil and gas setback fights in each state. So I'm gonna ask each state to answer the following questions. First, what is the current state of setbacks in your state? And I'm gonna ask them to give a brief history or timeline of the important events that got um, their state to where they are today. And as a part of that, I'm gonna ask folks to talk a little bit about how the movement for setbacks um, was organized in their state, who the major player were, player, who are the major players were, um, and also talk about if they've sort of engaged with outside organizations or organizations outside of the sort of mainline environmental movement, anti oil gas fight. So um, to start things off, we're gonna ask the folks from Pennsylvania to begin the, uh, their introduction. So Andrew and Matt, you can take it away. Great, thank you. Um... So I'll take I'll take one part of this question, um, which is the current state of uh, setbacks in Pennsylvania. Um, so Pennsylvania has two categories of wells, uh, conventional and unconventional, and that's based on the uh, depth that the well is that the well is drilled to. So if it passes a certain depth, then it will be considered unconventional, where um, industrial scaled fracking is more likely. The conventional wells have a 200 foot setback uh, from uh, existing structures and also from water wells. 
the unconventional wells have a 500 foot setback from the same thing. So the water wells and the existing structures. However, these can be waived at any time uh, by the owner of the, of the house or, or by the owner of the water uh, well. So um, that's an important uh, factor in the setbacks. Um, municipalities are allowed to set their own setback that is more stringent than the statewide setback. However, it's not a very well-defined uh, situation and a lot of municipalities, especially um, smaller ones that might have only a few hundred people um, are uh, very reluctant to have stringent setbacks because they're afraid of getting sued by the industry or in some cases, even by state regulators. So it's, it's a pretty, uh, pretty complicated arrangement, but, um, but that's where that stands. Uh, hey, y'all. I'm Andrew. I'm with the Clean Air Council out of southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, I'm an advocacy organizer with the council. Um, so as far as like how the setbacks work and movement is organized in Pennsylvania, um, it's largely fought at the local level. Um, there's a lot of really great groups um, that I work with um, and who I don't work with, um, Protect PT, um, Environmental Integrity Project, Environmental Health Project, and others who are supporting setbacks at the municipal level in different um, areas. And then you also see those groups and others like Food and Water Watch, Pen Future, and Pen Environment, um, Frack Tracker, obviously, uh, collaborating in different ways uh, to push for statewide setbacks. Um, I'm like absolutely certain I missed groups who are like doing good work, uh, especially grassroots ones. So sorry um, if, if you're here, I didn't leave you out on purpose. So all these groups have been involved in various ways um, to fight to protect Pennsylvania residents from the effects of oil and gas industry. Um, and then some of those groups make up a coalition called the Protect Protective Buffers uh, Pennsylvania. And it kind of grew out of uh, Protect Our Children Coalition, which I was not a part of, but the Clean Air Council was. Um, and we've been meeting regularly now for about two years to share information, collaborate on events, um, keep track of relevant developments in our respective areas and kind of strategize around um, particularly municipal um, setbacks. Um, a lot of our organizations are focused on Western Pennsylvania, but there also are some folks working on the Eastern side of the state. Um, we haven't begun working much outside, outside of kind of the typical environmental uh, movement circles, although it's something we've discussed an awful lot. Um, we think this is really relevant to teachers and teachers unions, healthcare providers and their unions, um, uh, you know, like Trout Unlimited, you know, typical kind of conservation groups that usually don't get involved in these kinds of fights. Um, but it's difficult to build those relationships when our respective organizations are kind of siloed from each other. Um, and we also have a lot of, you know, all of our partner organizations are working on issues, not just setbacks, right? Um, like I have a steel mill in my backyard. Um, so a lot of these organizations kind of have a lot of different focuses, which I think um, contributes to, you know, our ability to fight back a little bit, but I'll leave it there for now. Thanks for pulling this together. Andrew, I was wondering if you could add maybe just um, a couple of, you know, brief minutes of explanation of why the focus has been primarily on, on local fights for setbacks in Pennsylvania. Um, that's a good question. I feel like for me personally, um, the organizers that I work with are really embedded in their communities. That's where their kind of like natural base and connections are. And in, you know, legislators in Harrisburg are uh, not always conducive to <laughs> um, environmental justice, you know, fights. So, um, you know, there's a lot of oil and gas money floating around. So it's not that we don't focus on statewide setbacks. Like we will we'll talk about that a little bit later, but, um, you know, it's where we have we have reach. Maybe Matt has a different perspective, but that's what I got. No, I, I generally agree with that. I think that politically it's been difficult in Pennsylvania at the statewide level. So um, the local level is is uh, 
where we can affect change at the moment. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate that answer. Um, I think that's something I want to think about as we talk about the differences in all three states tonight. Um, so we're going to switch gears and head out west to Colorado to answer the same questions. Um, if Lauren, Lori, and, and Kate can give us a rundown of the, the current state of setbacks in their state, the history behind it, and how organizing happened around the setbacks initiatives, um, and who was involved in it. So take it away. Yeah, thank you. Um, I will kick it off. I'm Lauren Petrie with Colorado Rising. Um, so we have uh, kind of a roller coaster of a history here um, between the grassroots and communities and regulating oil and gas. Um, for at least the past decade, communities throughout Colorado have implemented local bans or moratoria on fracking. Uh, most notably was the city of Longmont, where in 2012, residents passed a voter enacted ban on fracking. Um, and that local initiative passed with 60% of support. However, the ban prompted a lawsuit brought by the oil and gas industry, which then led to the Colorado Supreme Court ruling to overturn the ability of local governments to implement local bans, moratoria, or otherwise regulate fracking in any manner that is considered stricter than the state standards. Um, and that law, that ban was overturned in 2016. Um, by that time, about half a dozen other local municipalities had implemented bans and moratoria on fracking. So that uh, overturning of that ban left communities really vulnerable with virtually no substantive ways to protect themselves. And it left municipalities across the board scared to imp implement any kinds of regulations on fracking um, for fear of additional lawsuits. The previous setback uh, at the time was 500 feet for homes and 100 feet for schools and high occupancy buildings. The one caveat to that is that the industry could also be granted waivers to override that setback. So they're kind of voluntary when we know our state agencies um, basically granted waivers whenever they were requested. Um, so grassroots, um, during that time, the past couple of years, we've really come together in several different efforts to push for statewide ballot initiatives for setbacks. The largest effort was Proposition 112 in 2018, which aimed to create a 2,500 foot setback for new oil and gas operations away from homes, schools, hospitals, parks, playgrounds, water sources. Uh, the setback was unique in not just how comprehensive it was in terms of protected areas, but it also eliminated, completely eliminated the ability for the industry to apply for a waiver in order to ignore the setbacks. And fortunately, um, unfortunately, Prop 112 was defeated at the polls by roughly 5%, which was a much smaller margin than most people expected, given that the industry outspent the grassroots ballot effort by a margin of 50 to 1. Uh, the monumental effort, unprecedented in the state, that seeing it was it was a grassroots-led effort, it generated over 1.1 million votes in support of safer setbacks. And it actually became a really important springboard for the new state setbacks that were recently put in place. And I'll turn it over to Kate Christensen to talk about that. Yeah, I think um, Prop 112, even though it failed on the ballot, it was powerful enough and scared the industry enough that we were able to get some legislation passed at the state level that totally rewrote oil and gas laws. And we were pretty hopeful. It was passed in 2019 as um, the law was SB 181 and did some really important things. It changed the mission of the Oil and Gas um, Conservation Commission from fostering oil and gas development to regulating it. Um, it put public health, safety, welfare, wildlife, and the environment into the law. It meant that the regulators had to take these into consideration when approving oil and gas permits. And before um, this law was passed in 2019, the law said the state was a ceiling. So municipalities could not be more protective than what the state said. And with the new law, it, it said that the state was a floor. So there was a big push in the past few years for county commissioners and local cities to um, enact much more protective regulations, um, including setbacks and reverse setbacks. So, so in Colorado, the um, setback is set by the 
the oil and gas commission in the state and the reverse setback is set by local land use boards which means the difference is the setback is where drilling can happen from a home that already exists and the reverse setback is how close developers can build up to wells that already exist so um back in 2019 2020 we were feeling pretty hopeful and um about all of this, the mission change that created the 2000 foot setback from homes. And I will let Lori um, talk about what happened next. Thank you, Kate. So yes, uh, we were very hopeful with that uh, 2000 foot setback. I wanna be sure that we recognize that, um, you know, the 2000 foot setback wasn't the only piece that needed to be put in place. Uh, the mission of the COGCC, the Colorado, the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, um, remains, it, it states, to regulate the development and production of the natural resources of oil and gas in the state of Colorado in a manner that protects public health, safety, welfare, and the environment and wildlife resources. So it's not, you don't just pick a setback and then determine that and then say it's done. Um, unfortunately, we have uh, the COGCC is currently reviewing and approving uh, what we what we consider massive oil and gas development plans. Um, these these can have you know just one well pad at twenty wells up to uh, at one is over four hundred and fifty wells, um, and they're just trying to um, minimize the number of residents that are within that two thousand foot setback. But that does not translate to protective of health and safety. So um, as part of the, uh, this uh, bill, SB 19-181, that was passed in the legislature back in, in 2019, the COGCC is required to address the cumulative impacts. However, the cumulative impacts rulemaking, which should include um, the cumulative impact of air quality for both the new and existing sources of pollution, as well as other cumulative impacts, such as noise, dust, traffic, and more, um, that rulemaking has not actually been completed yet. So while they're going forward with these oil and gas development plans, and approving them, um, the rulemaking hasn't even started for that piece of it. And so it's, it's really difficult to see how these sites can be protective of public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. So this is, this is the frustration that the development with with that, it's that we need more than two thousand feet, um, and so there's and it's currently research still ongoing. Uh, Broomfield recently completed a house. Hey, Lord, your, um, your audio is breaking up a little bit. Uh, we kind of lost you after you said uh, my frustration, which I was very excited because you're about to get into like the good uh, analysis. Um, maybe try turning your video off real quick and seeing if that helps. So. Sites. And um, and children were also. Um, so, anyways, that, that is our frustration, and um, uh, there's been little consideration by the state for the local governments that have plans for new development. So we have these um, these ongoing frustrations, um, and. That is where um, we currently are at. And I will pass it, pass it back. Cool, thank you, Lori. Um, thank you, Lauren and Kate too, for that context, that was really important. A lot more, we have a lot more questions about this Colorado situation for sure. And we'll dive into that as we get into the panel moderation, but um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, now we're gonna switch gears again and shift over to California where, um, we're going to ask the same questions if folks could give the kind of current state of this uh, setbacks. Um, as all of you probably know, there's the recent victory of the 3200 foot setback, and that's really curious to hear about how it was organized, um, the timeline, and everything that went into it. So, Woody, Cesar, and Kobe, it's, the floor is yours. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this victory is definitely something that uh, it happened very quickly. Um, but the foundation to this was set, you know, over a decade, right? It was thanks to community leaders uh, that have been working, you know, to fight the, the issues in their backyard locally that realized that, you know, we can't rely on local politicians that are very entrenched in oil and gas money in the oil mecca of California, uh, being from Kern County. Um, 
And there's other people in California that deal with the same thing, right? Uh, so our, our recent victory with uh, SB 1137 uh, came from, uh, you know, a, a history of, of, of bills like AB 345, uh, SB 4, uh, 467, I believe, um, and also with uh, scientific information and studies that were based in California saying, you know, with these conditions in California, you need a setback soon. Um, and, you, uh, you know, that came with a 2,500 foot recommendation from the California Council on Science and Technology or CCST in 2015. Um, and most recently during a health and safety rulemaking, which was supposed to rapidly create setbacks for the sake of public health. Uh, it's in a three year process uh, with no end in sight, but a scientific panel reviewed the most up to date information and gave California the recommendation of 3,200 feet, um, which is where that number comes from in our recent victory for SB 1137. Uh, and that's something that, uh, you know, uh, communities like Arvin uh, are proud to say that they took a part of, you know, having taken part in, in every step in the way, right, from experiencing the health issues to collecting uh, scientific information through community science, to talking with legislators and decision makers um, and able to, you know, enjoy this uh, at the end, right? Um, and this is something that, again, it, it took every step of the way and bringing community members with us from the inside to the outside, I think was something that was unique to this. Um, because right before this happened, there was some leaks that happened in some very, very affluent neighborhoods in, in, in my, in my neighborhood actually about a few miles north of where I live and uh, you know this uh, brand new development that was two years old had two leaks and caught national attention and the, in that brand new development uh, CalGEM which is our regulatory oil and gas body here um, so had their first community meeting regarding leaks and the health effects of leaks first one and since then the last one ever and we got the regulatory body for um, you know, uh, mobile sources and air, California Air Resources Board, to do the first door-to-door -door knocking and collecting health uh, effects through surveys in that neighborhood. First time they've done that, and the last time they've done that since, right? So we put a lot of pressure on them. We brought a lot of eyes to, the, to, the, to this matter, and that caused uh, a, over, you know, a overview of a lot of wells that uh, led to a lot of leaks. And these leaks brought attention to regulatory holes um, that showed us enforcement is not the way. Uh, California is not capable of doing proper enforcement, so we need proper protections. And these setback zones are a way to make sure that protections uh, do not rely on enforcement and that it is something that exists at all times to protect uh, current and future uh, developments that could affect health. Yeah, and I can add on that um, and share a little bit more. So Cesar mentioned Arvin, and I want to talk a little bit more about this community for people who aren't from California or aren't from Kern County, where most of California's oil and gas come from, to really share. Um, in 2018, um, the fight for setbacks in California really um, started in this one community. Um, Arvin was able to secure locally a 300-foot setback between um, you know, homes and oil and gas extraction. And you're probably thinking 300 feet, like that's nothing, but really that should tell you about what kind of a place Arvin, California is and just how much oil and gas is there right in people's neighborhoods. And that 300 foot um, setback had, a, had an impact. Um, and so really it's something that started with the community. It started on a local level and it started several years ago. Um, and that was what really started to set the momentum up for where we are today, um, which is, as I had mentioned, we had these two legislative attempts that failed, but finally, the third one with the help of the scientific um, data that suggested one kilometer or 3,200 feet, we have um, the statewide setback. Um, and uh, we can't just focus on the amazing news. Um, like in Colorado, um, you know, we've got these kind of inept and here today, gone tomorrow regulators um, that says how to mention these are not people who are confident in their ability to carry out the mission, which, you know, similarly to the Colorado agency is to quote unquote regulate oil and gas. 
Um, it's up to us to really stick on these folks um, to make sure that they can do their jobs. And in the meantime, we'll be continuing with our community science um, to do it for them. And um, now in, Cal in California that we've seen setbacks enshrined into law passed through both legislature, um, both parts of the legislature and signed by Governor Newsom, um, what we're witnessing is a huge oil and gas industry opposition push in the form of a referendum or a ballot measure. Um, and so, so far, it looks like they spent $13 million to get the signatures. Um, if they get enough signatures by December 15th, then the big win we had, the 3,200 foot setback, will go to the 2024 ballot. And it won't take effect until, you know, legally, until voters have the chance to um, vote on it then. Um, it's going to be a bajillion dollar push. Um, they've already sunk a lot of money into this, and they're going to do everything they can to postpone our work and to, to keep at it. And so that's what the fight looks like coming up in California. And in the meantime, we're going to keep at it by um, pressuring CalGEM, which is the agency that can do the permitting, um, to really see if they're going to stick to, um, you know, permitting in, in neighborhoods now that, the, you know, there was a law in California legally recognized that it's dangerous um, to do so. So, um, but I think a little bit more on that later. And I, I'll pass to Woody before we, before we move on. Thanks. I have very little to add, but um, in my role as campaign lead with the Last Chance Alliance, which is a broad um, and, and somewhat loose alliance of, you know, hundreds of groups who have signed on to the same basic demand set, originally targeting Governor Brown um, back in the day, and then refounded to target Governor Newsom. Um, the one thing I want to tease out is that, you know, here in California, um, I would I would say I think there's been a pretty strong alliance between definitely between Greens and EJ and then also trying to loop in some of the other groups, you know, progressive labor, um, health professionals and others. Um, but I think one thing that's been really notable is, you know, this acknowledgement that to cut through the just kind of slow bought off regulators and uh, uh, legislature, even here in California, even Governor Newsom recently said, like too many of our Democrats here are wholly owned subsidiaries of oil and gas companies. He kind of walked that back later. He was in front of a friendly crowd, but that's the reality, right? And so it's not like, you know, you can never just get one person, there's no silver bullet, but there's been this analysis that, you know, we got to cut through that by getting executive leadership to get on our side. And then, you know, have like kind of changed tax over time, right? Let's run a couple, like a couple bills were run. That was huge. And then there's been this rulemaking process. And then ultimately the vehicle that passed was a bill um, with the Governor Newsom's support this time around, which was the big difference. So, you know, it's been a key focus and part of a larger campaign to ultimately phase out oil and gas production in the state. But, you know, we, we carry different parts of that message at different times. Um, but I think that that, you know, buy in from everyone at the table for these three core demands, thinking big and focusing on what we can achieve, you know, now and push first, which is always the setback, um, I think has been really key to the work. Cool. Thank you, Woody, um, Cesar and Kobe. And Woody, that's a great segue um, to go deeper into the strategy. So for the next um, section of this panel, we're going to dig really deep into some of the st uh, strategic considerations and lessons learned about tactics and strategy from these three different um, states. And so we're going to stick with California first, and we're going to kind of go back to some of the things that um, Woody and Cesar uh, and Gobi um, both went into towards the end by asking, when do you all think that a state or local government is ready for either a fracking ban, or I guess an oil and gas ban, or a setback? And then what are the steps that lead up moving uh, lead up to moving forward with a setback? I think we, we kind of dug into that a little bit with um, Woody at the end mentioned getting the executive on your side, the governor's office, um, and also the focus on leaks uh, and getting attention to leaks, especially next to um, really close to neighborhoods. So I wonder uh, if you all could talk about that for a little bit and kind of dig into this question of readiness and then how do you move forward with a setback? I can uh, take an attempt at answering this first. So uh, this question about readiness is really an interesting one. And what I've learned over the past couple of years being involved with this push for setbacks in California is that it's the community that decides when they're ready. Um, you know, 
when Arvin decided to make setbacks or to push for setbacks in 2018, it wasn't because um, that was the goal of the, you know, like local, you know, organization um, that works in Kern County. It was because the neighbors got together and decided and they formed a group um, that worked on that. Um, and so it, it really is just dependent on when the community is ready. And if you're here on the call now, then I think you're probably ready. Another lesson that we learned is that, um, you know, it took three legislative attempts to make this happen in California. The first time we ran this bill, it was just EJ groups. It was just environmental justice organizations, just communities in Kern and LA County where, you know, 80% of California's oil and gas comes from that were pushing for it. Everyone else said, we're too early. You can't try this. It's never going to happen. We have to do incrementalism. You can't push for this now. It's not going to work. Um, and here we are just, you know, like three or four years later, having, having won a massive victory. And the reason is because every single time you lead from the wisdom of the communities most affected, the frontline communities, um, even if you lose that particular battle, that particular bill, um, you could bring yourself closer to winning more. The first time we ran a setbacks legislation, um, it wasn't, it didn't even have a number, a distance attached to it. It just said the state of California within a year would have to mandate a setback. The second time we ran setbacks legislation, the number was 2,500 feet. And the third time when we won, it was 3,200 feet and also with some provisions that apply to current extraction on existing wells and neighborhoods. So even though we lost, every single time we lost, we came closer to winning more. Every chance that you have to push this um, you know, issue of setbacks as a solution to neighborhood drilling um, will bring us closer to the goal. And, and that's really it. Um, there are these trigger moments, like Seth had mentioned, where we see, you know, like the morning star leaks and we see these terrible things happening. Um, you know, for example, in Colorado, there was a home that caught fire in a neighborhood because of oil and gas um, extraction nearby. Um, every time we see those trigger moments, those, of course, are you know, emotional, and they make us want to double down on this fight and work harder. Um, but we don't need to wait for those. Um, we don't need to wait for those things to happen to, to you know, bring a group together um, to work on this. And I'll pass it now to Cesar or Woody if they have thoughts on this. And also, um, I think it was also answering the question about um, who else is organizing with the EJ groups. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, you know, I think when when it comes to organizing and being in touch with the effects of ground level communities and and what the focus of those communities are, it really takes a deep conversation in understanding how they would like to take part. And uh, at at the end of this, the reason some of these volunteers have been in this fight for over a decade is because you cannot uneducate the educated. When somebody knows what the, the oil well in your backyard does to your health, what it's going to do to the climate, what it's going to do for, you know, your, your grandchildren, people, there is endless amounts of motivation and discipline that appear magically, right? Uh, anger motivates some people, uh, love motivates some people, and having a chronic public health problem will present that type of motivation or, or love, in, you know, to protect your loved ones. Um, that these community members have been doing for, for over a decade. Um, uh, another thing that we were able to, you know, to leverage and, and, and help use was that, that uh, the media, right? Because uh, if this leak would have stayed with our local inspectors, they would have called the operators, the operators would have said thumbs up, and then it would have got swept under the rug, right? Um, we told everyone about this. It's the N in CCEJN stands for network because we work with everybody to get anything done. We never do anything alone. And when these leaks happen, we called everyone to call everyone else so that every legislator knew about this, uh, every uh, regulator knew about this, and nobody wanted the finger pointed at them. So they started pointing the fingers and having community members and environmental justice groups and legislators and regulators all pointing the finger is something that came in through this wide network of people that care about the climate, people that care about their children's health, 
people that care about you know the the local family economy and being ready to to shift their the local economy to diversify it these are all things that we have understood throughout this fight and we were able to leverage to make sure that uh, that all of this happened um i think this is something that when those leaks happened i was like expecting the the norm right that it was going to get swept under the rug and the stuff started happening i was like oh oh my god this is amazing uh, let's keep this going right so once it got into the public eye you can't uneducate the educated people started wondering why are houses built on top of oil field i live in a place where there's a lot of oil am i in danger right so our local reporting network started getting a lot of reports from different parts of bakersfield which is where the leaks were happening and saying hey i'm lightheaded and i have all the symptoms and there's an oil well in our backyard that hisses can you guys check it out right um, and so the more people knew about it, the more they were looking to decision makers to do something about it. Um, and they like to point to regulators, right? So decision makers and politicians can get regulators to do their job when community members are ignored. And finding out what pressure points work is important to that. Um, and that kind of knowledge comes through a giant network. So uh, finding people that can do a lot of different things is helpful. Um, because we do air monitoring and organizing and community science, but we don't have lawyers. And understanding the law is, is a very important part of this. So we're very, very grateful for all the resources that we share with, with different organizations. Cool, thanks. Um, Woody, did you want to add anything or are you good? I don't want to hog California time. As soon as you're ready to fight, it's time to fight. I don't know, is your, is your city council ready? You don't know until you try. Um, I mean, and I think like, you know, the setbacks are always, you know, setback, it depends on your political context. And I, you mentioned all the fracking ban as well, Kevin, you know, setbacks, fracking ban, depending on how much production there is in your area, like, are you going to be able to get a full ban or is the, um, you know, like focusing on most impacted folks first going to be the way to go? In terms of political viability, it's not easy. We've talked about all the challenges, but starting with like health impacts to people near drill, like, hey, that's always the place to start. And we're in a deep hole, so we got to start. I love it. That's great. Um, yeah, they're very different from the, the context I know, which is Texas. Um, so we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later. Um, and I'm also, when we get the q and I'm excited to hear you guys got folks to listen to the, the science um, behind 3,200 foot, which I think is an important question for, for folks in like me in Texas or folks in Pennsylvania, maybe Colorado as well. But um, We'll get to that a little bit later. Um, so for now, I'll, I'll open up that question. You know, when is the state ready or local government ready for a setback? And what are the steps that lead up to moving forward? I'll open that up and see if anyone from our Colorado panelists or Pennsylvania panelists wants to give a shot at that one too. Um, I can hop in for a minute. Um, I kind of feel weird following up uh, California on y'all's like big success because we just haven't had successes like that in Pennsylvania so I can't really speak to like when someone's ready um or like when 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 is uh you know state or local government ready because for us you know there's just not the political will in our legislative bodies to make it happen um there's you know that's one of the reasons people at least who I do work with have been focusing on um municipal level setbacks um you know legislators at the state level are kind of out of our reach on both sides of the aisle and they often take campaign donations from oil and gas industries you know all the organizing and mobilization in the world um in my opinion sometimes just can't change the mind of someone who just really doesn't care about you and really doesn't care about your community. Um, and unfortunately, you know, a lot of what it takes to increase setback distances lies in the hands of lawmakers who routinely side with industry day in and day out. Um, we can take steps to push them in the right direction. And we've seen, you know, on other issues like some hopeful movement. Um, we can provide them with research and analysis. Um, you know, I have a coworker, Lois, who gives tours. Um, of her community to legislators to see how this industry has like physically impacted her community. Um, you know, it, we can help write their legislation for them, you know, the way that like um, a lot of like conservative organizations do. But at the end of the day, 
our legislative efforts are always going to be outspent by industry legislative efforts. And many of our representatives prioritize oil and gas industry over public health. That's just the reality here. Um, you know, I guess a highlight is, is in Pennsylvania last year, um, House Representative Danielle Friel Otten introduced um, House Bill 1465. Uh, which would increase Pennsylvania state setbacks from 500 to 2,500 feet. And it also had some other, um, you know, provisions to improve uh, kind of like the waiver situation um, and things like that, but it never made it out of committee. Um, and so, you know, that was really disappointing. And like, I, I don't think we've gotten the results of whether or not she won um, her her race. I know it was like very, very close last time I checked, like within, you know, uh, like double digit margins. Um, I, I do want to know, I'm really inspired by like what Kobe was saying, uh, because I, I do believe that, you know, it's up to impacted communities to, to push um, on these issues. And it's where real power comes from. But frankly, we're just outspent and we're outgunned. And, um, you know, the, the industry really leans into the fact that in a lot of communities in Southwestern Pennsylvania, uh, particularly rural communities, they're the only economic game in town, and they hold that over people. They they don't just buy off politicians. You know, they'll they'll go into bars and they'll they'll throw money around and they'll make life good for a handful of people. Um, you know, but people are really suffering in these communities from health impacts and a lot of other things that come from, you know, uh, a lack of economic opportunity, and um, you know that's that's the talking point that legislators also, you know, cite is, well, we need these jobs here. The, you know, the, we're in, there's not enough jobs, there's not enough money to go around. Um, you know, meanwhile, you know, Shell's build, building a huge petrochemical plant, you know, right down the road and pipelines are exploding and, you know, um, the money's there. It's just, they'd rather spend it on, on taking from our communities instead of giving us something. Um, so not as not as in, inspiring <laughs> as uh, you know I think what the folks from California are experiencing, but it's kind of you know where we're at in a lot of Pennsylvania anyway. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. That's really important context, and I think you know a, a shared context for many folks in many of the oil and gas states. Um, and I can talk about personal experience with that too. And I think that's a really important thing to highlight and to think about and to air out there and talk through. So I appreciate you bringing that forward. Um, the next question, which I'm gonna give out to the um, the Colorado folks, and this is a good segue from, I think, Andrew's comments. Are there big risks for wasted resources and time if the public is not ready for the back? And what are those risks? Yeah, I mean, I'd say to echo um, some of the sentiments that were just shared um, answering the last question is that, you know, it really does have to come from community. And, you know, community really has to lead on the on the ground strategy. They've got to be in it to win it. They've got to be leading on messaging what resonates with their communities. Um, some things that we've also done is things like polling. We've done local and statewide polling a number of times. And the reason that we repeatedly ran with 2,500 foot setbacks was because it polled really well. We knew, um, you know, that we had voter support, but as uh, Andrew mentioned, very similar to Pennsylvania, there is so much power and so much influence. This industry has so much money that they just throw it at fighting the ballot initiative and convincing the voters that everybody's going to lose their job. We're all going to be out in the cold. Nobody's going to have food. The, the worst scare tactics you could imagine. So uh, I'd say, I mean, yeah, wasted resources would really be a big one is just knowing where your audience is at too, right? Going, if you're going to be supporting a community, is that community ready for that change? And uh, do you even have the resources the coalition built to enter the fight before you've even started. And I think we've seen that a lot of times where people have really good intentions, but there isn't a, a effort or there isn't a strategy to really build a solid movement 
around that and it just ends up taking away from other things that are going on. Um, and also to, from what Kevin was saying too, the, the question about wasted resources, if it's building momentum, and I love what Cesar was saying before, you can't uneducate people who know. So even if you lose, that many more people are aware of the health impacts and the environmental impacts. And so you're building on the next opportunity. And I think having the space, it's, it's hard because we have to be so reactive, right? We act to the, the next move that the industry makes or the next like, oh, wait, they're greenwashing this now? What? <laughs> like, like all our regulators now, on the ground, it looks exactly the same. On the ground, Colorado looks like it did five years ago. Our neighborhoods are getting cracked. But the regulators are saying, but we have the strictest laws. You know, so you have to be nimble. You have to be able to like, capitalize on those opportunities that come along where all of a sudden the key community wakes up and you connect with them when you're there. So I think there's a couple of opportunities that are like, bubbling right now in Colorado that I'm kind of excited about. Um, so yeah, a loss doesn't have to be a loss. It can just be an opportunity to build on. Yeah, I love that energy and I love that enthusiasm. Um, and I think that's important to keep in mind. I like, yeah, Kate, your point about if you've built something, if you've built momentum, even if you've, if you've lost the battle, it's not necessarily a waste of time and resources. I think that's really important to keep in mind. Uh, especially as we go through um, a lot of defeats in this in this movement, but continue to build like a powerful and strong movement. Um, and I guess the the next question, which kind of naturally shifts from that, which I'll focus towards the the Pennsylvania team. Uh, and I ask two questions together. Actually, one is what is a viable strategy for moving towards a setback in your mind? And two is kind of a sub point of that. Does it make sense to negotiate or compromise on target setback distances? And I think the folks from California talked about this a little bit, but we're gonna have the Pennsylvania folks address this real quick. Uh, I'll try to be brief, but I, I think aside from building like local power in municipalities um, to fight for municipal level setbacks, um, I think like one thing that I haven't personally done, but I've heard from folks in the Protective Buffers um, Coalition is walking municipal leaders through the process. Um, at least in Southwestern Pennsylvania, there's a lot of like older folks. Um, there's a lot of folks who are kind of like on autopilot. Um, you know, ordinances aren't online, websites aren't functional, like just the information part of navigating, like finding out what an ordinance is and like what it could possibly change to is like, a fight in and of itself. And um, so like helping walk, you know, what are essentially like part-time, like very part-time um, elected officials through the process seems to, to be helping. Um, providing them with examples of other in oil and gas ordinances and zoning that are more productive than what they have um, and kind of just educating them along the way. Um, shout out to like Lisa from Environmental Integrity Project because like she's been doing that and it takes her years sometimes to get, um, you know, municipalities, municipal leaders to a point where they're ready to, to explore that kind of thing. Um, but like to what Matt Kelso had said earlier, there's just like a real culture of fear um, <laughs> that the industry has cultivated. And so a lot of, you know, all of this education process, the challenge is that a lot of times municipal leaders will come back and say like, well, we don't want to get sued because uh, we can't afford the, you know, the bill um, because we're being like exclusionary to oil and gas. Um, so I think, yeah, I think a viable kind of strategy just to sum it up is, is working at the local level. And then when, you know, hope that that goes through and if it doesn't turn those people towards the state level, um, that's what we're trying out. It, it remains to be seen whether that's gonna work, but that's the angle we've been trying to take. Yeah, um, I see. I see the, uh, the comments here. There's, there's certainly some, uh, some, some gloom and pessimism, and and I think that all makes a lot of sense. Um, there are some reasons to be a little bit optimistic, though. Um, one is that uh, our attorney general, who advocated for a 2,500 foot uh, statewide setback, has just been elected governor. So it'll, it'll be on the table 
uh, presumably, if, if uh, that still is an important issue for him. Um, so that's that's an exciting development for sure. Um, you know, whether or not he'll be able to push it through um, both chambers of the Pennsylvania legislature, we don't know, but um, getting it on uh, the table is a big step up from from where we are right now. So I, I think that's a that's a important uh, bright spot to keep in mind too. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Oh, Andrew, just something to add. Yeah, I was gonna say like just to the question real quick of like you know compromising on numbers or like negotiating. You know, our our statewide setback is 500 feet. Um, it it's abysmal. Like it's terrible. And um, you know, some municipalities have have done better. I don't think there's been any above 2,500 feet, but I might be wrong on that. Um, our coalition is pushing for um, 3,281 feet, because that's like what we can justify with peer reviewed science. Um, and so like, we're, we're gonna support the 2,500 foot setback if that comes up, but like, we're always gonna advocate for, you know, what we can justify through peer reviewed studies of like measurable health impacts that we want to avoid. Um, and I'm I'm gonna say one thing here too, which is that I mean, if you were to compromise before the process even got started, then you're just ceding all of that territory in advance for really no good return whatsoever. So it's may as well just uh, stick to your guns and and say, hey, we want a full kilometer setback from these uh, problematic wells, and let the conversation begin. And then if you know, if it turns out that um, you know, it's a 1500 foot setback and, you know, that's more protective than what we have now, then so be it. But, um, but to make that uh, concession before it even starts doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And just being aware of that, I know like Pennsylvania and Colorado, the variances and the exemptions, it almost doesn't matter what your setback is if they're like full, if the variances are written into the law because they'll get them every time. So just being really aware of those off ramps or on ramps or whatever I'm calling it. Great, awesome. Thank you guys for that, um, those insights. I'm gonna open up the same question to Colorado and California. You know, what what do you think is a viable strategy for setbacks based on your experience? Um, and uh, also this question about compromising, does it make sense to or not? So if any of you all wanna address it, go for it. I was just going to say, I mean, on on the um, issue of compromising, ugh, um, you know, I, I feel like out here compromising has just never worked. It's never benefited community. Uh, you know, we got SB 181 passed in 2019, as Kate was talking about earlier, as was Lori, and a lot of the compromise ended up really making the bill almost worthless. It has almost no teeth. And so when it was passed, Governor Polis was like, this is a sea change. We just ended the oil and gas wars because we passed this sweeping law. And basically nothing changed. All it did was create a lot of you know fanfare for him that he did something great. And people on the ground, you know, regular residents, had no idea how meaningless that bill was going to be for them at the end of the day. The compromises, you know, for the setbacks, even it was like, okay, we'll give you guys 2000 feet. And everybody was like, wow, that's great. But they created so many off ramps within those setbacks that they're virtually meaningless. And so I think the idea of compromise uh, can be really just a negative for community. I mean, there is no compromising when it comes to protecting your health and safety, right? It's like saying, okay, well, do you want your kids to smoke regular cigarettes or lights, you know, cigarette light? It's it's that kind of a compromise. And it just really never in my, in my opinion, or from what I've ever seen, it just never benefits community the way that it should. Yeah, I'd like to echo that. I think, um, you know, being being firm and asking for a mountain, it will get you a molehill, you know. Uh, I think oil and gas lawyers are very aggressive um, and they like to complain a lot. 
So if they can complain about anything, they will. And that's how they, they tend to chip away at things, right? Because the true power does come in, in how enforceable a law is, right? Um, fighting for every inch is important because if they want to take that 3281 to just 3200, that's not as meaningful as changing a should or a will to a should, right? Um, this regulator will do this. I, I'd rather say this regulator should do this. And then it just takes the teeth away from, from a lot of these, these new laws and regulations. And I think making sure that uh, the laws are as enforceable as they are um, applicable is important, right? So uh, fighting for every inch is not only important, but it's a good diversion, right? Uh, because sometimes the, the, the true prize lies in that sneaky English. And if no one is paid, paying attention to that except for you, then you can come out and, and be like, well, okay, well, now we have this very specific language that stops everything or, or makes something very cumbersome, right? Um, so it's a game that none of us like to play, but is something that we have to do in order to fight back at their consistent chipping and nagging um, from a legal process. And they can do that because they have the money to do that. Uh, and staying firm it definitely helps not water a lot of these things down. I, I just have the guy from um, Princess Bride when they're trying to get into the castle, like, stand your ground, man, stand your ground. <laughs> like that is like what's going on in my head now. Because you really have to like have everybody have their hands up after the laws get passed, after the ballot initiative, because you it's not like you, you should celebrate all your wins and then continue to be vigilant, right? Um, I think that is a takeaway here. And then see the pants off them. That's what I want to do in Colorado. Like, if there's any pro bono lawyers on this call. The only thing I'd add real quick on strategy, not to uh, repeat myself too much from before, but, um, you know, it's like every every state is different. Every political context is different. And like, you know, Andrew's talking about how getting them something through statewide in Pennsylvania. It's like there there is realism that needs to be at play right um but there's the opportunity with shapiro and who knows so the thing i would just offer is the you know just how key it feels for at the state level to not lose sight of the piece of the executive not that they're the only piece on the board by any means or that you know like here in california ultimately the law was passed through a legislative mechanism um and the governor moving on it over the years was also probably a key development along with champions of legislature everything else so um, and, you know, the rulemaking process here that was purely executive um, and didn't need a legislative start to happen uh, stalled out because, you know, industry can wield power everywhere. But, you know, it's one tool on the table where, you know, you're dealing with one person, you got to move. Um, while in the legislature, you know, you've got people left, right and center who are all bought and sold. So that's one thing I'd offer, though, obviously not the, the end all be all either. No, that's a really good point to add, I think. Um, and it's interesting, <clears throat> think about this context, all three, all three of these states are now run by Democratic governors, or, um, and yeah, you have a pro-fracking one in, in Colorado, I'm not sure what the new governor is going to be like in Pennsylvania. Um, so that's a really important question. Uh, if it's open to you as a, a strategic avenue to engage the executive branch of the, your state government. Um, so we're we're about the 65 minute mark. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, we're going to go 75 minutes today, but totally understand if folks in the audience <clears throat> need to jump off after an hour. You know, appreciate the the time commitment and being willing to to join us and listen. This really well, it's been a really great discussion so far. Um, we're going to wrap up the moderation by kind of going state by state and looking toward the future. Uh, where does organizing go for now? What is the viability of setbacks? Kind of how we're going to wrap it up. So I'm going to start with California. Um, and you guys touched upon this a little bit in your introductions, but I want to go a little further into like, where do you go now that you've won this major victory? What are the next steps for the movement? What are the, bar what are the barriers to implementation and enforcement? And as a part of that, how are you organizing to oppose this current industry pushback via the, I think it's a referendum, right? So um, open that up for the California team. Yeah, I can take this one. So um 
there's a couple of things that happen next in California. Um, right now, the oil and gas industry is spending millions of dollars to get 1%, I think, of the registered voters in the state, um, tricking them, saying, sign here for lower gas prices, sign here to stop Newsom's high gas prices. Um, and at other times, petitioners are in grocery stores telling people, you know, sign here to stop neighborhood drilling. And, you know, people just go up with a clipboard and sign it, and they don't realize that what they're actually signing is the referendum to overturn the rule that we made. Um, we're pretty confident at this point that if they've got the money and spend it, they're going to qualify. And so the next couple of years are going to look like two things for us. The first is continuing to educate people on the reality of neighborhood drilling in California. Um, like Cesar said, when you educate someone, they can't, they can't unknow it. You know, when you tell them that the end of the, the beginning of the pipeline is in their backyard, they can't unsee it. And so um, we're going to spend a lot of um, our energy doing that. And, it, and it's not, it's not just with the goal of, you know, winning when it goes to the ballot on, you know, if and when it goes to the ballot on 2024. It's with the goal of making all of our communities stronger against the different pushes from the oil and gas industry, because there are other fights happening in California right now, too. Um, you know, with toxics works, with carbon capture, with abandoned oil and gas wells, that's really important for us to be able to educate people on um, so they know that when they go to vote on something, they vote against big oil and for their own interests and educating them that that is their own interest. Um, and the second part of the fight is actually going to continue working with um, and pushing the state regulator CalGEM um, on enforcing um, the law, even though it isn't legally a law. Um, and so we're going to keep our um, pressure up on them so that, you know, when we review the first batch of um, permits in the new year and then in a year's time if there's another batch of permits in another year um, that we're making sure that not only are there no new permits within the setback distance but all of the other um, elements that um, we worked hard to fight for in the bill um, on existing wells and on engineering controls to mitigate oil and gas neighborhoods that those are all continuing and that those are all present too. Um, so that's kind of what the twofold fight in California looks like moving forward. Um, and also, I think it looks like um, continuing to be in solidarity nationwide um, and, you know, having more of these conversations and supporting y'all um, and continuing to support each other with a lot of the lessons that we've learned, um, especially here in California, um, because in that way, we'll not only have, you know, political pressure from within the state, um, but um, make this a really just a political issue for the entire nation. Um, and even if it will take a long time to win, but to be able to just put the um, the issue in front of people and pick, force them to pick a side um, will eventually generate the political will that we need to abolish oil and gas drilling in, in neighborhoods everywhere um, as a first step toward a just transition. Sasad and would you anything to add? Not for me. Yeah, I think, you know, one quick thing I can add is that um, anytime I've sat and talked with an oil field worker and explained what setbacks was, they say, oh, I don't want my child to wear that, you know, high, the H2S monitor to school or at home. And if they did and it ever went off, I would be worried. And if it went off a lot, I'd be very worried. Um, there's never been an oil worker that has disagreed with setbacks it's the oil representatives that want to convince us otherwise. And I think that's a very sobering thing to keep in our mind. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that context and thank you for the comment. Um, we're we're going to ask a similar question to Colorado, um, but kind of focus it on the problem that y'all are facing kind of front and center, which is the variances and exceptions. And, and considering the fact that this is the center of the frustration, as you guys put it, in Colorado, uh, kind of have a two-part question. One is, um, think, keeping in mind all of these issues with variances, are setbacks still viable or useful in your state? That's part one. And then part two is, how have organizers in the state responded to the variances and exceptions problems? And what do you feel are the next steps in increasing health and environmental protections? Thank you, Kevin. I could I could start with the uh, the variances, and I think it's very important to recognize that um, the COGCC needs to protect the public health, safety, welfare, and the environment, and that two thousand feet was based on.
one study, CDPHG did a study we're studying, but that does not um, does that, that does not mean that that is protective. So we really need to finish this cumulative impacts rulemaking, which the state is required to do, and determine just how far that setback really needs to be, and then begin to address the process of um, granting variances. They should be very minimal. And um, additionally, uh, the COGCC does not look at a community's future development. If the, if the homes aren't built yet, despite the fact that a dense community is coming, they don't even consider them. So th those are a couple of pieces that really need to be addressed um, in our state still. And our um, th this cumulative, rule cumulative impacts rulemaking is still upcoming. Um, and so that will be our opportunity to uh, consider this, um, continue to um, uh, focus on these needs. Uh, but we also need to, I'll, we have this slight issue that the state continues to approve permits while we're trying to get to this point of protecting the health and safety. Um, and I'll pass it over to Lauren McKay to, uh, for the second part. So um, the second part of the question is talking about what's next for our state. Is that what it, okay. Um, it's hard to say, really. Like now we have, like we're seeing how this law has played out, right? We've seen that that we passed a two thousand foot setback with the mission change, and basically, it's meaningless for the regulators. So, do we continue pressuring at the COGCC? Do we pressure our local governments to pressure the CDC COGCC? Because it seems like unless the person speaking to the regulators lives within 2000 feet of the proposed drilling, the regulators aren't going to pay attention. So, but they will pay attention to local governments. So if we pressure our local governments to talk to the CDPHE and the COGCC, that might have some, a little more impact. Um, I don't know <laughs> the experience that Lori's had though. Um, so it's, is there another ballot initiative? Is there, uh, as, can we get a tougher law passed this year? Um, I mean, setbacks are still really super important to public health and safety. They're super important, but how do we get the regulators to take them seriously? That's that's the million dollar question right now. Yeah, and I think for here in Colorado, it's how do you close those loopholes? Because right now, what the COGCC has, those state agency regulators, they're just looking at it and they're going, well, we're just going by the rules. They're, they're checking all the boxes. They're filling out all the blanks. And so as long as they answer their questions and dot the I's and cross the T's, then they really don't have grounds to deny any of the permits or the waivers or anything like that. And um, as Kate said, I think it really is important to fight for the strongest setbacks. I mean, some of the latest studies I think have said impacts up to a mile. Um, the more we learn, the worse it is. And, you know, but what has really complicated things here is the fact that poll is signed 181 and the rulemaking and everything is so full of loopholes that even if we were to come back and say, yeah, we're going to run another 2,500 foot setback or a 3,500 foot setback, the messaging and the industry is always, no matter what it is, they're always going to message that you're fighting for a ban. Doesn't matter what it is, it's a ban. But, um, you know, the industry is just going to say, hey, you guys just got 2,000 feet with the rulemaking. What do you mean? You guys are never happy. You want another 500 feet? Come on. And so the fact that that law passed and the setback um, rule gives the 2,000 feet, you know, you, we'd have a hell of a time messaging around the fact that that 2,000 feet really didn't change anything. Um, because all the industry and all polis as well is going to be like, we just gave you guys 2,000 feet and you're never happy. Um, so it's, it's really complicated when we think about how do we move forward fighting for setbacks here in Colorado, just based on that. Yeah, thank you for those fascinating um, insights. It's such a complicated issue and just so many elements of it. Um, but I totally understand where you guys are coming from and like where the fight is. And it's amazing how there's the technical elements of you really have to know and there's at the core of it, though, is still this grassroots to getting, getting people involved and getting state officials to listen to them. Um, and we're finally going to pass that same kind of question over to Pennsylvania, the where do we go from here question. And I'd love to hear from you guys about what are the next steps for the movement? You know, what are the kind of major barriers going forward? 
and what kind of value can setbacks offer if you're able to pass them locally or statewide? Uh, so yeah, Andrew and Matt, go for it. Um, I mean, I th I feel like I've been talking about the major barriers the whole time. It's you know the industries just filling coffers, you know, um, of uh, folks on both sides of the aisle. Um, besides for you know a, a couple standout legislators. Um, I mean, I guess not a barrier, but like good news, um, like Josh Shapiro just won the governor's race. He was the attorney general who like really went after oil and gas companies for their violations. He went after businesses for labor law violations. His office put out a report, you know, with a list of very specific um, recommendations for how to rein in the industry. Um, and, you know, also acknowledged that our, you know, the Department of Environmental Protection hasn't been enforcing the laws that are on the books, you know? So I think that's, that's helpful. I think that can like really open some doors, but he also has described himself as an all of the above type of guy when it comes to energy policy. Um, so I think like our strategy is gonna be like help clear the road, right? Help, help show them that like, actually this is a thing that people want, right? And like, obviously the value that a setback would add to communities in Pennsylvania is like an improvement in public health. But I think politically, um, you know, young people care about climate, young people care about environmental justice, right? Like, and I think any politician <laughs> could really like gain a lot from, from pushing policies that protect public health and push for like really, you know, creative and, um, effective environmental policy, right? Um, whether that's setbacks and protection oriented, but like, especially when it comes to ap adaptation and mitigation, you know, uh, mass transit, localizing supply chains, like all these other issues that, you know, really could, could make Pennsylvania more livable for people. Um, so we're, we're gonna keep pushing at the local level and try to get communities to put pressure on legislators. Um, you know, I think we're going to continue to try to put pressure on Josh Shapiro. Um, and I know I'm going to be like organizing in my community to just build power on any issue that I can. So Matt, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, we really do pay attention to what's happening in other states as well. And, you know, your victories are, are uh, really helpful for us in our fight because we do have a long way to go. We do need a lot of uh, political cover, uh, so even if this, even if they're not perfect, uh, you know, the the setback in Colorado is a big big deal for our narrative here in Pennsylvania. And like, hey, other states are trying to take care of their public health. Why aren't we doing the same? And that's that's I think an important component too. So uh, yeah, keep up the good work. And even though it's not what you want it to be, um, you know, it's still helpful for us at least in in some respect. Great. Yeah, thank you both for that. Um, that wraps up the panel moderation, uh, the moderated panel portion of our evening. Uh, we're a couple minutes over. I do want to leave this open in case um, there are questions from the audience. Uh, I totally understand if any of our panelists need to hop off or any of our audience members need to hop off because we've been on for a long time. I'll keep this open though, and I'm going to pass it to Kyle, uh, who's going to take charge of our Q&A. Um, and we'll see if we can squeeze in a few minutes of um, audience-based questions. Uh, thank you everyone on the panel for, I learned so much from that discussion and still processing all the things you guys said, but that was incredible. Kyle, you can take it away. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. And thank you to the panelists. That was really informative. Um, as, uh, as I was listening, I was also collecting some questions from the meeting uh, chat room right here by Kobe. Nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Um, if anybody has any other questions, please add them to the chat uh, while we are working on adding more questions to the chat. Um, I have a couple of questions here uh, specific to um, each of the states. Um, I'm going to start with California real quick. Um, and while Kobe just left, uh, I think uh, we have um, some people that can answer this. Um, California has been a distinct, distinctly successful at organizing individual communities at the state level. Can you give some recommendations for coalition building and how this was possible? I, 
I could give it a crack, but Cesar, you've been in, you've been in the fight a lot longer than me. Um, do you have any initial thoughts? Yeah, I think, you know, when it comes to coalition building, um, getting community members involved, obviously, again, is, is very important. So making sure that their needs are met or that they feel like it's their fight is, you know, the, at the forefront of that. Um, and a lot of, of work beforehand um, in educating the public of, you know, um, these are the people that produce the pollution. These are the people, you know, that are in charge of it. And uh, these are the people that have failed you. Therefore, these are our targets. Um, you know, making sure that uh, different, knowing what different communities face and deal with uh, can change the way you fight. You know, for, for example, down here in, in Kern County, uh, we can't say just transition. We have to say diversify the economy. Um, but that's something that, you know, may go over very well in a different part of the state with the voting base. So understanding where you're organizing and uh, adapting your messaging to fight for the same goal, although it may be in a slightly different framing, could, could be a part of that. Thank you, Cesar. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to stick with California for one more quick question. Um, well, I guess two more Quick questions. One, does California have a reverse setback? This was uh, asked by one of our audience members. And are PFAs used in fracking in your state? Um, I'll take the latter real quick. California has banned fracking and a review of the chemicals uh, that have been injected into wells over the course of the last, um, I think, five years showed that there were not any PFAs uh, in underground injection in California. That was work done by PSE Healthy Energy um, and really wasn't actually publicized. It was a little work that we did together uh, with Frack Tracker. Um, so uh, does California have a reverse setback? Um, not that I know of. Not that I know of either, but um, the local housing fights aren't something we've gotten too deep into. It could vary jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Right. Um, Okay, well, let's uh, jump to Pennsylvania since Pennsylvania is the latest there. Um, <clears throat> so Pennsylvania, um, I have one question for you. Uh, you spoke of walking local, local elected officials through the process and the fear of local communities of lawsuits. Have there been successful lawsuits by industry or is this largely a fear tactic? I, I have some thoughts on this. Um, and I'm gonna say it's kind of both and also it's complicated. So. Um, the, the the industry doesn't have to even win to have an effect. I think that that's one thing that's worth keeping in mind. The threat to small communities, and, and as I said, many of these communities have a, a thousand people or fewer, uh, the threat is really economic and it doesn't take much of a push to really wreck the uh, borough, the borough's budget or the, the or the township's budget um, for the entire year um, in in those kinds of situations. So that's that's part of the threat. Um, I, I do think it is largely, you know, wielded as a threat. Like, well, they can always they can always sue you, and they're always afraid. And so you have the municipalities, and there's about three thousand of them in Pennsylvania, sort of. Uh, proactively positioning themselves in a way so that they won't get sued um, by by designing their um, ordinances in a way that's less protective than they would like. So um, the other the other aspect of it is is that there was a slightly different situation, but there was a injection well in Indiana County um, and they were sued that that this was Grant Township. And they were sued not by the operator of the well, but by the state's regulator. So it was the it was the state's Department of Environmental Protection that sued because of this uh, this home rule charter that had prevented the uh, placement of this injection well in that township. So the the threat is very much a real one. As a follow up, uh, are PFAs being used in fracking in in Pennsylvania? Um, that is a good question, and I think that that's one that we're we're currently working on trying to uh, 
establish. Um, I, there was a recent um, map that was produced that showed uh, eight different wells that had um, some sort of PFAS chemicals. Uh, and, and of course, it's a whole host of uh, different chemicals that fall into that category. And the other thing is, a lot of times we're just never going to know because when this is disclosed in the industry's um, um, uh, frac focus site, which is where these disclosures go, there's a lot of proprietary results. So if there's, uh, you know, fluorosurfactants, you know, that are used, well, it could well be a, one of these PFAS chemicals uh, or, or, or maybe not, um, or these other proprietary uh, chemicals that are used in the fracking cocktail. We have no idea what they are. Thanks for that, Matt. Yeah. Um, we'll bring it back to setbacks and uh, to Colorado. Um, I have a question. Have waivers also been an issue for Colorado's reverse setback? Yeah, well, reverse setbacks are local land use stuff. So the state set the setback rule, but like Weld County has its own reverse setbacks, which is really narrow. And then Boulder County has, or Broomfield has bigger reverse setbacks. So it kind of depends. I was actually in one of my conversations with regulators there, that was one of the reasons they gave for the variance, for the variances and the exceptions. They said, why do we care if it's 2000 feet from a, from a home when they're just going to allow developers to build up within 350 feet of it, which if that's the way the regulators are thinking, it's like really, really depressing. Um, but I did, I know we're running late, but we passed some interesting PFAS legislation. So maybe we could talk to people who are interested that oil and gas, we had the same experience in Colorado. They say there's no PFAS, but we're finding it everywhere in all the fish they test in all the streams. And for not using PFAS and fracking, oil and gas fought that PFAS bill super hard. Um, so anyway, just wanted to circle back to that real quick. And yeah, reverse setbacks is all local land, land use stuff. And so on that note, I believe a local government can create a loophole or a variance for a, re a reverse setback because that is their, uh, they have the authority to do that. Grant one, at least, sure. Yes. But not revoke it entirely. Right, uh, which brings me to the last question here um, for Colorado. Um, beyond fighting individual waivers and individual drill sites, uh, what's the strategy for patching these holes in the setback regulations, addressing the waivers? And uh, can you sue the pants, pants off them? I like to see the pants off them. The Right now, the strategy is cumulative impacts because we are, like almost all the drilling being done right now is in, we recently got designated as an EPA ozone non-attainment. That means we really have to look at our ozone and oil and gas is the number one cause of ozone. And so hammering that is gonna be probably our biggest way right now because we're not having any luck with the variances and we have to look at cumulative impacts. And also there's these giant massive drilling plans, kind of comprehensive area plans they're looking at that we're fighting in a variety of ways because those are like, some of them are 150 wells, some of them are 450 wells. Um, and that's how they're saying they're looking at cumulative impacts by just looking at the 20 square miles worth of drilling. It's really crazy making. I just, yeah, I just want to assume, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, but go ahead, Lauren. Yeah, I mean, Colorado Rising, we have um, one of the attorneys that we're working with was actually one of the prime sponsors on Colorado Senate Bill 19181, which was the compromised bill. Um, and yeah, I mean, we are constantly looking at avenues where we can sue the industry. Unfortunately, a lot of that does rely, though, on current law. And if the law allows waivers and it allows loopholes and it allows all these exemptions, it just makes it that much more difficult to bring these lawsuits. And so it seems like the playing field um, has really been designed to give industry the upper hand, no matter what avenue we're taking. And so um, we are still... We are still definitely looking at any avenues that we can for suing the industry or suing the state, um, whatever we can do. We just, we know that it has to be a very well thought out uh, legal strategy. 
Um, and what was the other thing about the caps? I mean, yeah, and the industry is doing a great job of saying that, hey, these caps were actually reducing emissions because one thing that they're doing with these comprehensive area plans while they're bringing in 100 or 400 new wells is they're saying, well, we're gonna cap a bunch of old abandoned wells. And so that's gonna offset the emissions. And we know that um, that's just more greenwashing from the industry. So um, yeah, we're constantly looking for creative and you know, new ways to attack, you know, whether it's, you know, how do you fight these exemptions? Is it just going and passing new legislation that says we're going to close the loopholes? Um, and then one of the, you know, really brutally honest truths is that the industry has so much influence at the state capitol that there's kind of a, a saying that's thrown around in Colorado, if you play at the capitol, that you've probably heard this, that, you know, nothing passes through the legislate like nothing passes through the state capital without oil and gas's blessing and so that's kind of one litmus test is you know if it's going to actually do something oil and gas is going to hate it um and so if something is going to pass it means that it's been compromised or watered down enough where it's really not going to harm the industry and so it's really figuring out how do you make an impact in this political environment? And it's a really a million dollar question. I actually think the EPA is gonna sue us because the COGCC permits the well drilling, the CDPHE permits the air pollution, and they're both like rubber stamp committees, but no one has been able to tell me at either of those regulatory bodies, if the COGCC permits the drilling, can the CDPHE reject the air pollution permit? And if they can't, then our drilling regulation regulators are setting us up for all this um, ozone in the non-attainment area that we're going to we're just going to get sued by the EPA is what's going to happen. Um, maybe we'll see. That's very interesting. I see a lot of parallels with California, um, the way the regulatory uh, network is set up. Interesting. Well, thanks everyone so much. I'll pass it back over to Kevin to wrap us up. Awesome. Thanks, Kyle. Um, thank you, everyone else. That was amazing. That was uh, probably one of the most informative webinars I've been to. So thanks to all of our panelists for putting so much effort into this webinar, planning it, coming up with uh, discussion points, and having this really great discussion today and sharing their experiences. Big thanks to Kyle for being one of the leaders in organizing this and taking a really important role to make sure this happened and getting all the discussion questions together. Um, thanks to Frack Tracker. Thanks to Halt the Harm. Thanks to all you audience members for um, joining us and sticking with us. I hope you guys learned something. Um, and I hope you all will also um, take some of these lessons into your own setback battles. Um, and we definitely want to continue this conversation. And I think um, myself and the panelists will get together at some point and talk about where we go from here um, and how do we take this beautiful kind of organizing moment, information, resources, and what do we do with them. So. For now, thanks, y'all, and have a great night.